We've had university-affiliated preschools, religiously-affiliated preschools, preschools with you know, long histories and good reputations. And I think that there really is no way to know. Um, generally speaking, we get fewer reports of this most heinous form of abuse from smaller care settings. The larger the setting, the greater the risk, I would say, in general. We get, we get far fewer complaints of babysitter cases, for example, than we do of daycare center and preschool cases. The immediate question is not how big is this or what is its organizational structure or are babies really killed and eaten or is this an illusion? Those aren't the questions. Those are, those are later questions to be answered. The basic question is, are there children presently suffering this kind of heinous abuse? Are our children at large at risk of exploitation in seemingly innocent places? And how are we going to find out if that is in fact true? There's enough indication here from both children who say it, adults who recall it from their own childhood, some investigators who find at least soft evidence, other clinical investigators who find physically, physical damage to otherwise untouched children. There's every reason to believe something is happening. We cannot possibly, as a society, condone a criminal justice cover-up in which defense attorneys tell us that those stories are so absurd on the face of them that it proves the clinicians and the cops and the kids are just making it up. It really deprives children of any legitimate voice to recover their own well-being or speak against injustice. Uh, the, the court system, uh, at its best, functions at the notion of an adult level of communication. What we know from research about traumatized children is they distort the sequence of events the way they organize and understand those events. Uh, the child in court is a very imperiled witness uh, because the credible child does not talk like a credible adult. And that's a, uh, a real sticking point in trying to uh, bring these things to the awareness of the legal system or even to the scientific community. Uh, the traumatized child loses the normal sequence of things interprets them retroactively in a different way, and then you hear a kid who's obviously hurting saying something that probably just couldn't be. And you say, well, I guess it couldn't be. Actually, that account that couldn't be is a telltale sign of something that was so overwhelming that the child could not retain it and could not process it in a normal sequential way. What we're talking about here goes beyond child abuse or beyond the brainwashing of Patty Hearst or Korean War veterans. We're talking about people in some cases who are coming to us as patients who were raised in satanic cults from the time they were born. Often cults uh, that have come over from Europe that have roots um, in the SS and death camp squads in some cases. These are children who tell us stories about being deprived of sleep all night, of then being required to work at manual labor uh, exhaustingly all day long without any food or water. When they reach a point of utter fatigue, uh, they may then watch other people tortured. Perhaps a finger might be cut off and hung around their neck uh, on a, a chain or a string as a symbol to them uh, that they had better be obedient. The third cluster of symptoms that the therapist needs to look at very closely is how the child feels about monsters, ghosts, witches, devils, Dracula, all the supernatural kind of thing. Um, again, there is a point in time when children do have nightmares that involve those kinds of supernatural entities and normal ages for that are, are again around the age of three. When you, get, when you get to kids who are four and especially five on up who are still having a lot of fears of ghosts and monsters and Draculas and that sort of thing, you want to be looking very closely at them. The child is really supposed to outgrow that. It's not supposed to be consumed with fears of, of supernatural entities. Children who've been ritually abused tend to think 
that there's a monster or a ghost living in their closet, that such an entity is going to come in through the window or the air vents and assault the child, that ghosts and monsters are sort of all around them and they're constantly being watched, harassed, or controlled in some way, or that the child has some super, supernatural entity of this kind actually inside of them. And what about this monster? Um, that, 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 nightshade. That's who? Nightshade. Nightshade. And where does nightshade live? Up right there. Right there. And what does nightshade do when I'll night... Dry this all up. Okay, I'll dry this all up. What does nightshade do when nightshade comes out? Oh, he puts kids in the grinder. And he gets in the inlet. And he gets in the pool. And what does he do in the pool? He swims. He swims. What else? Is Nightshade a he or a she monster? He's a she monster. A she monster. And what makes Nightshade come out? Oh, is that what Nightshade says? What makes nightshade come out? Could nightshade come and visit me now? Could she? What should I say to nightshade so she will feel safe and come visit me? Could you say that again? Say it again. Say it again. I can't hear you. Put these back. Put these back. Was that Nightshade talking? It was. Hello, Nightshade. It's nice to meet you. Are you a monster? Are you a monster? I'm a good guy. You're a good guy? Oh, you're a, a good girl. You're a good girl. I'm sorry. You are three. One of the primary defense mechanisms that we find in children who have been so severely traumatized as children who have been ritually abused is dissociation. And one of its um, most extreme manifestations is multiple personality disorder. What we see with this little girl is a clear-cut case of multiple personality disorder. She has between six and eight clearly identified different sometimes identifiable by me, personalities that come and go, that can sometimes switch when we ask, but most often switch when certain kinds of outside things happen. Now this monster is a new personality that we've never met before. We often find that children have had monsters who have been programmed by cults in order to um, get a child to get an altar that will help them perpetrate, that will become cult identified. And even the good news is this little, this little girl is telling me that this is a good monster, which makes me feel like this is a monster who doesn't want to perpetrate anymore, may not feel the need to perpetrate, and that may be why she came out at this time. My approach in ritual abuse cases is, number one, to combine uh, the parent with the child. It seems to me that it, the major effort in ritual abuse is to divide the child from the parent. So what I intend to do is to combine the parent and the child together and reconnect those bonds so that the child feels safe and secure. The relationship between the child and the parents must be healed. It is absolutely crucial that the child not go on feeling that the mother is going to poison uh, her food or the father is going to kill the child with a gun. Um, it's just absolutely crucial that the child comes to feel safe with the parent, supported, nurtured, and protected. Very, very importantly that the parent can protect. Now here we go. I'm going to tell her not to be scared, all right? We have to tell her really clearly. Okay, pretty lady, even though the monster bit you on the lip, you don't have to be scared. And you don't have to be scared anymore of any monsters because you know why? Mommy and Daddy will never go away and they will never leave you and you will always have Mommy and Daddy
to help and you will never have another monster ever scare you again. The child is usually told in the course of the ritual abuse that the parent knows that the abuse is going on. On the one hand, the child is told you have to keep the secret, but on the other hand, the child is told that the parent knows all about it and endorses the abuse. At some point in the treatment, there is a, a real opportunity for that child to be made aware that the parent did not know that these were abusers at the preschool, that the parent thought this was a good school, that the parent is very, very sad and upset that the child was abused this way, and the child needs an opportunity to express anger at the parent for taking him to this terrible place. This is another aspect of, of healing the relationship between the two that is very, very important. The next thing I try to do is deal with the child's post-traumatic stress syndrome. Try to give the child complete reassurance, cushion the child from any fear, make the child feel protected and safe, and do everything possible to let the child be in control of their environment. This is difficult for the families because the children are so erratic at this point and demanding and unconsolable. And everyone has to kowtow to the three-year-old at this point. But that is what is needed in the beginning of treatment with children who've had this experience. 